Welcome to the second part in our Lighting University Light Bite series, Light for Public Space. We've been exploring remarkable lighting projects across the world that showcase how lighting is transforming public spaces everywhere. In this second part of our three-part series, we'll talk about a framework for people's engagement with light, specifically how new technologies are transforming people's relationship with environments and, by extension, urban lighting systems. We'll talk about a spectrum of public engagement that allows us to really think about and categorize the different types of projects we see around the world. Again, we're drawing on lots of different examples in many different cities, really trying to get a sense of the diversity of projects that are being designed and created today. Here you can see a selection of some of the projects that we'll talk about today. What's important in this context is the availability and the ease with which digital lighting technology, LED lighting technology, can be integrated and combined with embedded computational tools. So with the transition towards digital lighting, we really find ourselves in a world where sensors, interaction devices, input devices, and LED lighting systems are all part of the same infrastructure that allow designers, creative practitioners of all kinds to create new kinds of experiences for the urban realm that allow people to feel that their cities are coming alive in new and different ways. I'd like to propose a spectrum of engagement for digital lighting that allows us just to, as a tool, think about the different types of experiences that people are creating today. This isn't meant to be a mutually exclusive set of categories. However, it's meant to help us really subdivide and categorize the different types of designs we start to see today and also give us a sense of the diversity of skills and backgrounds that are being brought to bear on the design of urban public spaces. I think it's really essential to keep in mind that we're also seeing a transition towards different types of professions coming together in order to create these experiences, whether it's interaction designers, lighting designers, theatrical specialists, and urban designers. In looking at this spectrum, we can think of it really as something that transitions from more subtle to more directly interactive. So on the left-hand side, you can see a category called ambient. Ambient really has to do with the elements of an environment that create the baseline, that create the background in a way for a scene. In the second category, dynamic, we start to see how people actually designers especially, start to think about their designs coming alive over the course of a day or over the course of the year. So in a way, it's a narrative structure that's created by the creative practitioners and associated with the specific installation that they've created for a space. When we move to the next tier, we talk about responsiveness. Responsiveness really has to do with the aggregate data about a place leading to the transformation of the infrastructure. So for example, as you start to collect weather data over longer periods of time, and as that data, those data potentially impact the design of a tower, for example, or a media facade, you start to create an infrastructure that is responding to the metabolism of the city. And this layer really is more dynamic and more unpredictable than the other ones that it doesn't have in that it doesn't have a specific built-in set of content or information that can be predicted in advance. In the final tier, interactive, people are directly transforming the state of, of a system or an infrastructure through their presence, through their input, through their ability to directly transition a space into something different. So this might be uh, an interaction uh, design that involves mobile phones or other kinds of input devices, for example. So what does this look like? You can see here in these sketches how humans and people and citizens are always at the center of each of these examples. You can see on the left-hand side the ambient scenario, then the, then the dynamic scenario, then the responsive scenario, and then the interactive scenario, where people are directly affecting change. What really matters across all of these examples is that people are at the center of the story. 
that their ability to interact and exchange in a meaningful way with the space is what should be driving the design intentions of any project. So let's look at a few examples of how this might be implemented in real life. The first example is around ambient lighting. So here is Leipzig, the plaza that was redesigned by Lichtkunstlicht in the downtown that has both a 10th century historic architecture in the background as well as a really modern structure in the foreground. So this plaza has to accommodate multiple different layers of architectural history and also urban functions. And what the designers have done very artfully is created a space that using just white light creates an ambient backdrop that allows people to experience the plaza in a way that is both visually comfortable, that is unified, that allows them to navigate easily and take advantage of these really beautiful public spaces and seating areas around the, around the fountains in the center. Another example of ambient light that's quite different is this one from Sondermarken Park in Fredericksburg, Denmark, that was designed in 2011 by B plus S Architecture and Lighting, where they've created a very well-lit plot pathway through this beautiful park landscape that allows people to easily navigate the space and actually experience the city and the green spaces in the city in a comfortable, inviting way well into the evening hours, being an important factor in this particular climate, of course, in order to allow people to take advantage of open spaces even in the early evening hours when normally they might not feel as comfortable being in those spaces. As we transition to the next tier, we're talking about dynamic lighting. So again, dynamic lighting is the idea of integrating a narrative structure or a transition of different types of elements and scenes into the design of a space. This example here by Janet Eckelman called Her Secret is Patience is located in downtown Phoenix, Arizona. When her sculpture was, was designed and, and, and installed for the first time, there was a lot of controversy about this sculpture. People thought, why are we investing so much in this simple um, additional visual feature? However, what, was come, what people have come to acknowledge and, and really appreciate since 2009 is that this sculpture reflects the dynamism and, of their downtown area. Throughout the year, different colors are projected onto the sculpture, allowing it to reflect the seasonal changes that might be less visible otherwise in the city in, uh, in Arizona. And so the sculpture gives people a sense of seasonal change. It gives people a sense of identity as well for their downtown area. And in fact, the sculpture has become the logo for the downtown central business district. Another example of dynamic light is Régis Cluzet's reinvention or rethinking of the Tour Montparnasse in Paris, an iconic structure that breaks out of the typical skyline that is much lower in the city of Paris. This building, designed from 1969 to 1973, was extremely controversial at the time, and it was really designed to break away from traditional architecture in the city and demonstrate uh, the ability to design tall skyscrapers. At the time, it was the tallest. And what Régis Cluzet did in order to really um, bring this, um, this architecture that has had a difficult history back into the positive um, kind of feeling of the city of Paris is to rethink the corners of the, of the building through some very subtle lighting elements that actually make the building speak to the city in a new way. So both as the building transitions from day into night, the elements on the corners create a narrative story that really almost like the city kind of winding down at the end of the day transitions from daytime to nighttime. At the same time here, you can see the seasonal changes in color that he's selected and designed that allow the building to really also reflect the dynamic changes in the city over the course of a year. So in a way, it's become a timepiece that allows people to see in a large scale way uh, reflected in the architecture of their city the dynamic transitions that are taking place all around them all the time. As we move towards the responsive layer, we're starting to actually react to aggregate data. 
So here's an example by Leo Virial for his Bay Lights project, which celebrates the 75th anniversary of the San Francisco Bay Bridge. What you can see here are 25,000 LED light points that are mounted on the cables of the bridge. Together, they form a very specially shaped, low-resolution urban display. This urban display allows uh, only low-res content to be displayed. And what Leo has done in a really extraordinary way is programmed elements that are emergent over time and that respond to the metabolism of this location. So data about transportation, the tides, weather, are all part of the background in the algorithms that he's selected in order to create dynamic content that changes over time and is completely surprising each time you look at it. So rather than having a preset sense of of content that is curated over the course of a year, you have an emergent set of uh, elements that are playing out every evening and really feel like they're reflecting the meta metabolism of the place in a real-time way. Another example is a project by KVA Architects for the 34th Street Public Ferry Terminal in New York City where they've also installed sensors below the ferry terminal to understand what's taking place with tide levels, water speed, and currents in order to create elements within the structure of the ceiling of this enormous new ferry terminal to really reflect the metabolism of the place and the experience of that place and thereby enhance it and allow people to re-experience it in a way that is much more visible since they don't necessarily have a sense of what's taking place underneath the platform of this, of this structure. When we move to the final tier, we're really talking about interactive lighting. So a really beautiful recent project by Claudia Paz for the Banco del Crudito in Lima, Peru, shows how this large interactive podium here where these children are playing is actually an extension in many ways of the entire building facade in front of it. So here you can see how the building facade lit up with three-dimensional pixels is connected directly to an interactive input platform in front of the building. So in some way, people can extend themselves out onto this building and have an impact on how the city is actually seeing their uh, interactive play at a very large scale. So again, there's an enormous set of light points here that are extraordinarily arranged in a three-dimensional way to create a sense of depth and a sense of almost natural beauty that is now hovering in front of this rather traditional bank building. So people can actually come up to the podium in the evening hours and directly ha interact with different scenes. She's created four or so individual scenes that reflect natural experiences. So some have to do with sand, some have to do with rain, which is very rare in Peru. Some have to do with the aurora borealis, so really being able to be almost inside the aurora borealis as someone interacting with this podium. And as people move their hands across the different interactive installations on the podium, they see directly reflected on, their, on the large-scale building in front of them what they're doing. So it's both a, 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 an experience for individual people that is surprising and fun, as well as something that creates a lasting and um, participatory uh, element in the city skyline. Another example for interactive lighting is this one called Street Seats Boston, done in collaboration with the Design Museum Boston, which created these interactive light points in the evening for an evening exhibition in a district in downtown Boston. Each element is individually addressable by mobile phone from people's in in very easy way where they don't have to log in. They just go to a web app and instantly can interact with these light points. So they can choose colors, which allow them to create something that is reflective of their playful experience of an exhibition that is presented in public space rather than as traditionally you would find it in a museum. So revisiting some of the uh, themes that we talked about today, I would like to leave you with this thought. 
In complementing the unpredictable and surprising nature of urban life, networked lighting can enhance those aspects of cities that make them such great places to live. I think it's really important for us to keep that in mind, since as we have more access to digital technology, we always have to bring it back to the needs of people and the needs of citizens as they experience the city and all it has to offer. So I'd like to thank you for listening to this part of our series, and please stay tuned for part three on April 23rd. I'd like to thank all the people whose projects I talked about today, as well as the amazing collaborators and input uh, I've received from people across inside and outside the company. I'd also like to thank my co-author, Antonia Weiss. Thank you.